everybody. Well, that was just a way to wake you up, wasn't it? <laughs> so, as Kimberly said, who, who here has never been to Senior Planet before in this space? Okay, you are in a righteously fantastic space. This space is the only technology center in the United States specifically for older adults. It is a marvelous space with lots and lots of programs, so please be sure to go visit their website, seniorplanet.org, later on and see what else it is they offer. I'm going to do a little survey here. I know some of you. I've known some of you for a very long time, and some of you are new faces. By a show of hands, who has a computer in their home? Who has a laptop? This is not working at all? Oh, okay. This isn't working yet? No. I'm stripping myself of this. Ooh, that's a little hot. Can you turn it down a little? Thank you. How are we now? Okay, good. I didn't mean I'm talking on. You guys can't hear me. Fascinating. Um, who has a, a, a tablet computer at home? Who is on Facebook? Who is on Twitter? Who thinks that's a bunch of hooey? All that stuff? Oh, raise your hands. I know how you feel about it. Um, who in this room is under, other than the staff at Oates, who here is under the age of 40? I'm not either under the age of 40. We all belong to a very particular club. We are what I refer to as digital immigrants. We were not born with a keyboard or a mouse in our hand. You know digital natives. It's your grandchild who comes over with something that looks like a chopping board and it's an iPad and they're already watching a movie and they're only four years old. I'm going to ask you, even though some of us have just met right now, to do me a favor. From this point forward, please stop from this point forward comparing yourself to digital natives. You are much smarter, you are much wiser, you probably make better decisions, but statistically you will be slower on the technology. That's just the way it works. And that's okay, because we have time on our hands, right? So that's perfectly fine. The point of today's talk, it's a four-part series that I'll be doing here, and today's talk is to walk you through how to sort of navigate the digital world that we're all in right now. And in navigating the digital world, it does not mean that you need to adopt the technology. What I want to do is I want to let you know what the technology is, but you don't need to adopt it because if it doesn't benefit you, you don't need to change what you're doing. My goddaughter is sitting over there. I don't wear her shoes because they don't fit my feet. I don't use the same technology that she uses because it doesn't suit my needs. So it's very important that you pay attention to what technology it is that suits your needs. So I'm going to try to walk you through that. This is the evolution of man with computers. Ouch. Um, those of you that know me may know I, I can be a little stubborn about things. I've had students who have such bad posture when they're using the computer that I will ask them to take off their belt and I've been known to strap their chest to the back of their chair. It's super important that when you're using this technology, you don't hurt yourself. The National Institute of Health says that every 40 minutes, you should take a 10-minute break. Now, those of you that work on computers, you know that you don't take a 10-minute break every 40 minutes. I highly recommend that you get a kitchen timer. And you put a kitchen timer or your smartphone by your computer and actually set it for 40 minutes and see what it's like to stop at 40 minutes. And take a 10-minute break and do whatever is fun for you. The hardest thing on the computer, on your body, other than your posture, is your eyes. Dry eye is a terrible thing for your eyes, and it makes any eye situation that you have worse. Dry eye happens because you don't actually have to moisturize your eyes when you're looking at a computer screen. When I'm looking at you, I, my eyes move across the crowd, and my eyes are watering while I do that. When I'm looking down at a book, they naturally water. The distance of the computer screen to your eyes requires you not to move your eyes because you can actually take it all in without moving your eyes. So when the kitchen timer goes off after 40 minutes, there's an exercise that I'm going to show you that you should do to prevent dry eye. The kitchen timer goes off, you take both of your hands and you rub them together, I'll do it this way with the mic, you rub them together until the palms of your hands are warm. And then you put the palms of your hand over your eyes with your eyes closed, then open your eyes and roll them around a bit, then take your hands off and look in the distance. So let me repeat that for you. You take your hands, you rub them together until they're nice and warm, you put them over your eyes, open your eyes under your hands, roll them around, and then look in the distance, and that's a great exercise for preventing dry eye. Prehistoric Googling. Do you all remember those lovely libraries? I love those things. And actually, our public library got rid of them and replaced them with a computer, and I bought some at an auction, and I was really happy that I had them. 
The reason I have this here is all of you that raised your hands and said you have a computer at home, you've crossed the digital divide. But I would argue that you're hanging around on the shoreline, which means the average person, if you actually counted it, only visits about 10 websites a week. Where you get your email, maybe where you look up the weather or a hobby that you're into or some travel information, and that's it. There are hundreds of millions of websites out there. And I want to be sure, not that you need to visit all of them, but I want to be sure you get a flavor for what those digital natives are doing because they zoom around and visit all these different websites. So one of the handouts that's on your chair is a hand-picked list of 200 websites broken down by category. Now, I don't expect you to visit all 200, but if you would visit just one new website a week, the point of visiting the website isn't because necessarily you're going to stay with that. There's a chair up here, my dear. If you want to sit, there's one right there. Oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Um, the reason for going is websites are like a language, and they change all the time. And the more familiar you get with different websites, the easier it is when the websites that you go to all the time seemingly changes for no reason, and you suddenly don't understand how to use it anymore. We've all had that happen with our email accounts, where all of a sudden they upgraded and you're completely lost. The more you sort of get flexible by visiting different websites, the easier it is for you when changes happen. So, who in this room has a computer that's five years old? Who in the room has a computer that's eight years old? Okay, so in the Smithsonian, ten. So in the Smithsonian, there's a woolly mammoth, and right beside it, they're waiting for your computer. <laughs> the problem with the computer that's ten years old is it's slower, and sometimes it won't open newer things. So I'm going to walk you through, all of us at some point are going to replace our technology. I want to walk you through the choices you have about whether it's a computer, whether it's a laptop or a desktop, and whether it's a tablet that you're looking for. Up here in the top corner is a desktop computer. Fabulous, all comfy, everything spread out, it's nice and big. Those used to be so expensive. When you're thinking of replacing your technology, if you don't need it to be portable, these are super inexpensive now. This is $400 or less sometimes. So if you're thinking of replacing it and it doesn't need to move around, that's a really good price point. Over there is a laptop or notebook computer. It's portable, but that's sort of a relative term because most of them weigh about seven pounds. So you can certainly move it from the dining room to the bedroom, but you don't want to carry it over your shoulder all the time because it'll just do damage. Um, someone asked me the other day what the difference was between a laptop and a notebook, which brought me, in my memory, I was in the Berkshires visiting a friend's, actually, it was with your dad, um, and we were at a farm. And I saw my first pig. They're huge. And one was peeing in the other's mouth. It was disgusting. And so I said to the farmer, I said, so what is the difference between a pig and a hog? And he said, what do you spell it? So for your purposes, when somebody asks you the difference between a laptop computer and a notebook computer, it's only the way you spell it. There is no difference between the two. But this computer is a netbook computer, N-E-T, not N-O-T-E. It's a netbook computer, and the reason I show it to you is laptop or notebook computers, the price range is fairly high. You can get one maybe in the 600 range, but most are between like $800 and $1,200, so they're pricey. This, as you can see, it's smaller based on this guy's hands. These were designed primarily for college students, and college students were carrying their computers over their shoulders, so a laptop was too heavy. They couldn't afford the very inexpensive thin laptops, so these come in at a price point of between two and three hundred dollars. So if you're looking to replace your computer and you don't want to spend that much money, a netbook computer is a great choice. What it lacks is that little drawer that pops out that you can put a CD or a DVD or a cup of coffee, if you want to be dangerous, on the drawer. So it doesn't have a media drive in there, but it's a super nice price point if you're interested in it. That's right, dear, our ancestors had tails. Something changed with technology not so long ago where suddenly we didn't have to have cords go from one thing to another. You had been using wireless technology at home for a long time. Because remember the old-fashioned phones, the headset had a cord and then had a cord? Most of us have had handsets in our homes that were using wireless technology to begin with. What changed for the technology that connects us to the internet is this use of wireless. He has Wi-Fi. 
Wi-Fi is a wireless technology. Wi-Fi stands for wireless fidelity. I was actually doing a talk not so long ago at a library in Queens, and there was this fantastic 86-year-old woman in the front row. She, she was so French. She came up, I don't have a computer. I never want to use a computer, but I wanted to learn what they are. That's my perfect audience as far as I'm concerned. I don't care if she gets on a computer. I just want her to know what it is and know that she can do it if she wants to. At the end of the talk, she went out to the front of the library and her 14-year-old grandson was there to pick her up. And because she heard me say that Wi-Fi means wireless fidelity, she said, do you know that Wi-Fi means wireless fidelity? And he was duly impressed. So if you want to use it at a cocktail party, now you know what Wi-Fi stands for. So Wi-Fi is the technology that allows our device to connect to the internet without being plugged into something. A modem is what you have in your home that allows you to have a connection to the internet. Wi-Fi makes that connection wirelessly. So whether it's a tablet or a laptop or a smartphone, that's the wireless technology. There's Wi-Fi here. There's free Wi-Fi at most libraries. They call Starbucks a hotspot. It could be a hotspot if you want to pick somebody up, but really what they mean is it's a spot where you can get free Wi-Fi technology. So when Wi-Fi technology happened, manufacturers of the technology decided to take advantage of it, and they created the smartphone. Those are three different kinds of smartphones. A smartphone, who has a smartphone here instead of a cell phone? I didn't ask that question before, just sort of curious. So a smartphone is like a cell phone, but it connects to the internet. So you can check your email, you can use a GPS, you can email photographs. That was the first iteration that took advantage of the Wi-Fi connection along with e-readers. E-readers came out at just about the same time and an e-reader allows you to pull a book, whether you're buying it or you're borrowing it from the library, onto the device. And then manufacturers said, well, here we've got this little teeny device that does all kinds of stuff and this one device that really just reads books, can we combine them? And that's when the first tablet came down the pipeline. And the very first tablet, the most popular tablet, was the iPad, which I have one right here to show you. This is an iPad. The great thing about Senior Planet is, if you come here and you don't own any of these devices, they have them here for you to play with so you can decide whether or not it suits you. Um, to show you an example of a different tablet, this is a Trio tablet, it's significantly smaller. So let's walk through sort of the decisions that you want to make when you're thinking about buying these kinds of devices. But before we do that, this is the most important thing for you to remember from today. You can, you can forget everything else I said, but if you're using these devices, you must be careful. Bending over the way I see people do it all the time, crossing the street in New York City while they're on their phone, or the guy who was text messaging when he hit my sister with his car. When he got out of his car, which had flipped over, and amazingly he was able to get out of the car, he still had his iPhone in his hand. And he said to my sister, I just, I was brand new, I couldn't help myself. And luckily my sister was in shock, because if she wasn't, she would have broken his neck right then. <laughs> but she didn't do it because she was so freaked out about the accident. But we mustn't use these devices without caution, right? If they're such an easy distraction, but this is terrifying to me. When you look down and your head is at a 60 degree bend, you have 60 extra pounds on your spine. 60 extra pounds. So I want you to try to start holding your phone up here. I know it looks awkward, but it's good arm exercises. We can always use that. There are also lots of tables that you can get. Levenger has tables that are actually for reading, but if you're gonna use a tablet, you might wanna put your tablet up on something so it's as though you're reading a book instead of holding it and bending over. We don't wanna have you injure yourself while you're using this technology. We also wanna be polite about it. <laughs> One of those moments that only a New Yorker can really appreciate. The other day I was walking down the street and a man actually came up to me and uttered the words, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And all I wanted to do was say, practice, practice, practice. But instead, I knew he really wanted direction. So I pulled out my phone, and I showed him on the map how we could get to Carnegie Hall. And he said, thank you so much. As he turned away, he said, I hate those things. <laughs> and I, I, was like, oh. I said, why do you hate those things? And he said, because every time I'm in a movie, somebody's phone goes off. Do you think that's the phone's fault? No. Because we have the technology in front of us, 
Stupid people will do stupid things with it. They were stupid when they lived in caves. They're stupid now that they have technology. So we can't begrudge the technology for how somebody misuses it. So I want to be sure for you that you say, oh, I'm, a smartphone isn't a bad thing. The person who turned it on or left it on when they're in the movies is the bad thing. But this is bad, so I want you to be very super duper careful. If a tablet interests you, there are many of them on the market. I showed you my iPad. The iPad can go up in price all the way to $800. That little tablet, that trio that I showed you, I bought it for $120. I saw it for $99 the other day. So there's a super wide range of prices for tablets. All of them will meet your needs. Any tablet will connect to the internet. Any tablet will allow you to check your email. Any tablet will work as a GPS. Any tablet will take photographs or shoot video. So from your point of view, from the benefit point of view, all of them will meet your needs. It's a question for you about what your budget is, and potentially if it's compatible with the other devices we have at home, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is one piece of information that salespeople generally don't talk to you about, and it's a mistake that they don't. When you buy a tablet, if it has Wi-Fi capability, it means any place where you are that has Wi-Fi, like this space, you can connect to the internet. So, I have Wi-Fi in my apartment here in New York. I have a little cottage in Connecticut. I have Wi-Fi in my cottage in Connecticut. So I can use my tablet in both places. But I take a train back and forth every weekend. So for two and a half hours, unfortunately, there's no Wi-Fi in Metro North, which means I can't get rid of all the emails that I need to look at. I'd love to get rid of them before I get to Connecticut. So I pay for a cellular data plan. That means I pay Verizon or AT&T or Sprint or T-Mobile a monthly fee to connect me to the internet when there isn't Wi-Fi. That means that I'm going from my device to their satellite, their satellite to the internet, right? So Wi-Fi is the free connection to the internet. The cellular data plan is the connection to somebody's satellite and then to the internet. Why I'm telling you this is not every tablet has a cellular data plan. So, and the salespeople will forget to say this to you. So if you know that you want to have the capability with your tablet to use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week from anywhere, Wi-Fi alone will not do that for you. You need to have a cellular data plan so that you actually feed into that satellite. So when you go to the store and you're thinking about buying a tablet, just be sure to say, does it have a cellular data capability? Because if you buy it and it doesn't, you can't add that feature to the tablet. It does or it doesn't have that feature. Does that make sense to you guys? So it's just one of those things that often salespeople overlook. And I've had people say to me, well, I don't understand why I can't use it sometimes. And it's because they didn't understand that in order to use it everywhere, they need to feed into a satellite from a company in order to get to the internet. Because unfortunately, in this country, we don't have Wi-Fi everywhere yet. We can only hope that that changes at some point. Are there any questions at this point about that? Yes? The 4 and the 5G is related to the cellular? It's related to the speed. So it used to be 4G, then it was 5G, and then it turned now it's 6G. So that number is just going to keep going higher. So the higher number is a faster speed. Thank you for asking that, actually. Um, so if you're thinking of buying a device, if I were buying a car, I have no idea how a car, what happens in the engine. As far as I'm concerned, the horsepower is the number of horses it takes to pull the car if the engine's not working. I got no idea. But I can drive a car. So I'm not asking you to understand how the device works before you buy it. But I think it's very important that you get your hands on it or one like it before you make a decision. I don't love it when other people buy somebody some of this technology, especially the smaller stuff because it's very individual as to how it works for you. So the, these are actually the criteria I would use if I were buying a car. The first thing is, what's my budget? And this is one of the rare times in life that if you have a limited budget, it makes your life easier because you don't have as many choices, right? So if you've got $200 to spend, you're looking at an inexpensive but still perfectly capable tablet, or you're looking at a netbook computer. That's what's in the $200 range, and then it goes up from there. So decide on your comfortable cost. Then I want you to look at the device, and I want you to look at it for two reasons. I want you to look at it and say, gee, do I like the look of it, especially if it's a desktop that's going to be staying in your home. It matters if you like the look of it, but I want you to look at the screen. 
Even if you don't understand how to use the device, instinctively, one screen will appeal to you more than another. That's just the way it is with different people's eyes, and nobody can decide that for you. The third thing is feel. And I want you to feel it for two reasons. I want you to see how it works with your fingers, because everybody's different. And I want you to hold on to it and say, huh, they call this portable, but it's a little heavier than I want it to be. I want you to feel it and be sure it's going to be the right weight for whatever you were thinking that you wanted to do with it. In the book, Is This Thing On?, I actually have a 47-point test drive form, which sounds really unappealing. Luckily, you don't have to fill it in. What I suggest you do is you go to a computer store, you decide on the three things that meet your, the top three items that meet your needs based on cost, look, and feel. And then you tear the pages out of my book. I give you permission, don't tell my publisher. And you bring the test drive form with you. And you say to the salesperson, these are the three that I'm interested in. Can you answer the questions on this form for all three? And then you take it home and you call up somebody who understands it better than you do, or you send me an email or call me, I am happy to answer your questions. It'll take no time for somebody to just say, oh, you know what, this one doesn't have a built-in camera, so just forget about that one. Oh, this one actually has a feature that, you know, it just takes a little bit of time for somebody who understands it better than you two to, to tell you of those three which is better, but that helps you because when you're in the store, it's a little overwhelming. Essentially, I'm going to give you two pieces of information. If you only use it at a cocktail party, that's perfectly fine, too. When things are older, what they lack is space and speed compared to other technology. Speed, this is easy to remember, speed is measured in hertz, like the car rental agency. So just think, when I'm looking at something and I want to know how fast it is, I'm looking at the hertz. The higher the number, the faster it goes you probably don't need to buy the highest number. Chances are all you're really wanting to do is visit some websites and do your email and do some photography stuff. You're not playing crazy video games that require a lot of speed. If you are, then you want to go with the higher speed. Space, which is how much the device can store on its brain, is measured in bytes, which is spelled B-Y-T-E-S. But think bites of a sandwich fill my stomach. That's the easiest way to think of it as storage. And so again, there are numbers that are higher. You probably don't need the highest number. You probably can go with something in the middle. What takes up space on your computer is not email, because you're visiting your email. You visit websites. What takes up a lot of space on your computer is music or f photographs or movies, if you have movies stored on there. So if you are a light photographer, you know, a thousand pictures on your device, not a big deal. But if you're a photographer, you're going to go with a higher number of bytes because that takes up a lot of space. If you're a videographer or you store a lot of music, you're going to go with a higher number of bytes because that takes up a lot of space. But those are really the only two things that you have responsibility for understanding at all. The rest of it you can have filled out on the test drive form and have somebody else walk you through it. Are there any questions about that before I go on? Anything? Yes. Well, okay, so it's a, it is a tablet a computer? It's one of those fine lines. It computes information in a digital format, so it can be argued that it is a computer. What a tablet doesn't do well, and it could be partially because of its size, but it doesn't do, if you're writing a novel, or if you still have a company, and you've got lots of documentation that you're doing with the company, you don't want to have a tablet for that. If you do a lot of Excel spreadsheets or, or financial information, it doesn't work well on a tablet. But otherwise, a tablet can meet your needs perfectly as long as you're good about not bending over on it. A couple of things, actually, I'm glad you asked that. Um, a tablet, by its nature, a tablet means that you're using your finger on the glass screen in order to navigate because there's no mouse. Your finger is the mouse. For a lot of people, especially if you have Parkinson's or arthritis, that's a problem. My mom's fingernails are super long, so she can't do it. And my sister-in-law's finger pads, for whatever reason, are very dry. And she can't use a tablet. So if you want to buy a tablet or you're having trouble with yours, get a stylus, which has a rubber tip on the end. Be sure it's compatible with your kind of device. This is $16 in the computer store, but if you buy it on Amazon, you can get a dozen of them for $2.73, and you will lose these the same way you lose your reading glasses. So you want to buy a lot of them if you choose to do a stylus. Um, I have a confession to make. I don't actually know how to type with all 10 fingers, and a friend of mine in the back here knows exactly what I'm talking about. I'm the world's worst typist. I didn't learn how to touch type. 
I call it the Columbus method, find the key and land on it. So using a tablet to type a lot isn't a problem for me because I'm just poking at it the way I poke at a regular thing. But if you learned how to touch type, it is a bear to touch type on a tablet. It's just unpleasant. So you can also do lots of modification. My iPad is in a case that actually has a keyboard attached to it. So that helps me when I have a lot of typing to do. It makes it feel more like a computer than like a tablet because I have that. So I'm going to add another, another word to your glossary today. Wi-Fi is the technology that gets you from your device to the internet. But what's the technology, what's the wireless technology, when you see somebody walking around with one of those Star Trek things in their ears, I love those, sorry if anybody here wears them, but I really do. That is talking wireless to the phone in their pocket. That is a Bluetooth connection. From device to device is Bluetooth. From device to the internet is Wi-Fi. So if you have a laptop at home, and you have it in the bedroom, and your, t your printer is in your closet, and you're able to print without plugging the laptop into your printer, that's a Bluetooth wireless connection. It means that your printer has Bluetooth capability, and that's why they're talking to each other. If you buy a tablet, you won't be able to plug it into your printer. There is no plug that goes between tablets and printers. So if you're buying a tablet, and you want to be able to print, when you buy your printer, you want to say, does the printer have Bluetooth capability? And that means, and they're not any higher in price point now, it's pretty common. So here's your quiz for today. What is the technology that connects my keyboard to my tablet? Bluetooth, yes. You win a prize. Well, you might win a prize, there's a raffle. Who knows? <laughs> you might actually win a prize. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about social networking. Now, I have a question for you guys. I was just in Florida doing a series of talks, and this screen came up at five different places, and the response of the audience was this, and I thought, did that say anything wrong? Is this offensive to you? No. Okay, somebody said no effing way, it's not a problem, but that wasn't somebody in Florida. Um, <laughs> so I, what we've talked about is the digital world that we have around us that we touch. And what I want to talk to you now about is the digital world around us that people go visit. And one of the things that we need to talk about if we're talking about that is social networking. I refer to social networking as the green beans on the internet. You know what it's like when you hand a child a plate of food and there's a hamburger and there's mashed potatoes and there's green beans. And they eat the hamburger and they eat the mashed potatoes but they won't eat the green beans. And you say to them, do you not like green beans? And they say, oh, no, I don't like green beans. And then you say, have you ever tasted green beans? And they say, well, no, I've never tasted green beans but I know I don't like them. Social networking, doesn't it feel a lot like the green beans on the internet? You immediately are kind of repulsed by it, and yet you have no idea really what it is. So my job today is not to convince you to use social networking. My job today is to tell you what it is, to tell you what the benefits are, to tell you what the bad things are, to tell you how to protect yourself, and then you can walk away and never use it, but you'll sound like an adult when somebody says to you, why don't you like it? You can actually explain yourself. So let's just walk through it for a little bit. The big player in the arena right now is Facebook because there was a revolution named after it. So it's undeniable that Facebook has a presence for us. I'm gonna walk you through a couple of scenarios of why a revolution was named after it. Um, when Hurricane Sandy happened, as we know, a lot of us lost our electricity here for at least a week, some for much longer. The same thing happened in Connecticut. And my mom is disabled. And so I skedaddled to Connecticut as fast as I could because I didn't want her to be alone without electricity. I have an iPad, as you know. I have a solar battery for my iPad. So I actually was able to keep power on my iPad when the storm was happening, or after the storm. Um, CLMP is the electrical company in Connecticut. And they were working so hard to try to get the electricity back up on Facebook. I have friends in New York, and I have friends in Connecticut on Facebook. I posted on Facebook and I said, if anybody sees the CLMP truck, can you let me know? And within a couple of hours, somebody posted on Facebook, they told me the street that the truck was on. And I got on my bicycle and I rode over there and I told them where my mom lives and I said she's disabled and seven hours later she had her electricity back on. Other people waited a week. So to me, there was no other resource I had that would have found that information for me. I'm going to have you go into your imagination right now. Let's say you have a Facebook account, 
And let's say that tonight, your entire family is in Wisconsin for a family reunion, but you didn't go because you didn't want to miss this talk at Senior Planet. So you stayed in New York, and you also wanted to have a beautiful first day of spring. Um, so you're here. But you have a Facebook account, as do most of your family members. And at 9 o'clock tonight, you go home, you turn on your computer, and you connect to Facebook. Because some people said that they would put pictures up from the reunion. And in fact, that's what's happening is, uh, Ruth, you're, you're not there, and your daughter's not there because she's in California, she has a book deadline, she couldn't go. And Uncle Charlie broke his hip, and so he's in the rehab center, he couldn't go. So the three of you are connected on Facebook, hoping to see the pictures. Aunt uh, Ruthie is there. She is 94 years old, and she's had too much sangria, and she is dancing the Macarena. And so somebody says, Aunt Ruthie, can I take your picture? And in the time it's taking me to say this, they've taken a photograph with their smartphone, and they have put that picture up on Facebook, and you are looking at it on your screen. And you type below it, oh, tell Aunt Ruthie she looks fantastic. Simultaneously, your daughter types underneath it, tell Aunt Ruthie I'm wearing that good luck sweater she made me in high school, it's what I wear whenever I have a deadline. And underneath that, Uncle Charlie, who's flat on his back with his tablet on his belly in the rehab center, says, tell Aunt Ruthie as soon as my hip heals, I'll be dancing with her too. There is no other technology anywhere in the world that can make that kind of connection across the world. That's why a revolution was named after it. So let's talk about why people don't like it. On the internet, you can be anything you want. It's so strange that so many people choose to be stupid. Perhaps ex-Congressman Wiener comes to mind for you <laughs> when we hear about people being stupid. So, digital immigrants are those people who are 40 years or older. Digital natives are 40 years or younger, and half of them are under 20, and their frontal lobe is not fully developed, so they're not making great decisions. So let's just push aside all things we hear about kids making big mistakes with this technology, because we are not that stupid, we are not that young and naive. But there are problems with the technology. You have total control of what you choose to share on Facebook. But times have changed. It used to be, let's say you're having an affair. Or listen, it's a terrible thing to propose that people are having. Let's say instead that you're in love with somebody who's not married. That's much better. And you decide to write them a love letter. And they read the love letter, but it's, you know, this is clandestine. I don't know why, but they're not supposed to be in love with you. And they throw the letter into the fireplace. The only person who could take the letter out and put it back together again was probably Agatha Christie. Otherwise, that letter is gone for all time. So, you use email. And you write somebody a love letter with email. And lo and behold, somebody else gets on their computer, they hit forward by accident, they print it, they show it. It's much easier to share this technology than it used to be. It actually happened to be my sister, Lee used to live in Piermont, New York. This is about 12 years ago. I went to visit her house. She has horrible, horrible instincts about interior design. There was actually a Winnie the Pooh bedroom, just to give you one example of how bad the house was. So after I saw the house, I wrote my mother an email, and room by room, I was mean, but it was funny. Room by room, I took apart her house, and I sent it to my mom. So not so long ago, I'm at my mom's house, and I look at her inbox with her Yahoo account. She has 18,000 emails. And I said, Mom, do you ever throw away the emails? And she said, no. And so that's kind of how she talks. Oh. So I, took, I showed her how to group the emails and throw them away. So if a week passes, I, I'm emailing her, how you doing with the email? She said, good, but it's slow. I said, why is it so slow? She said, well, I want to read every one before I throw it away. So my mother's reading all the emails. So another week goes by. I drive into Connecticut. My sister lives in a cottage right near us, too. My sister's in her driveway knowing I'm driving up, and she, she can be mean. She has this horrible look on her face, and she's holding a piece of paper, and I realize my mother found the 12-year-old email. My mother thought it was so funny, she went to send it back to me, but as Freud would say, she accidentally sent it to my sister. Twelve years later, I'm in the doghouse because of an email I sent. So it's a lesson to us all that when you put it in writing, Tiger Woods can speak about text messaging, right? When you put it in writing, you're vulnerable to somebody sharing it, even if the rules are not supposed to be that way. I've sat in on conferences where people have talked through all the settings for Facebook, how to change the privacy settings. It doesn't matter because you just don't know how people are going to share things. So I have one rule of thumb for you. When it comes to what you put in writing, ask yourself if it passes the front door test. In other words, would you be okay putting it on the outside of the door to your home? 
I wouldn't just put that about my sister on the outside of the door of my home because I knew I'd get in trouble, right? If I'm going on vacation, I don't post pictures while I'm on vacation because I wouldn't put them on the outside of my apartment in New York and say, well, this is the first of my two weeks in Hawaii, let yourself in, right? And so I put them in after vacation. So this is the only test that will protect you, as far as I'm concerned, is the front door test. And this is a great thing to say to your grandchildren. Don't tell them rules. Don't tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Just pose to them that they should ask the question, does it pass the front door test? So we've got the negatives of social networking. We've got some of the positives of social networking. It's up to you whether or not you find it beneficial. Facebook isn't just about sharing between two people. Facebook also, organizations have Facebook pages. Senior Planet has a Facebook page. So you could go onto Facebook and never share anything with anyone else or have a single friend on Facebook but take advantage of the organizations that share their information on Facebook. Or you could choose to never use it at all. Another reason why I think people hesitate is they hear about the amount of time that some people spend on this. And that's not what you have to do. As a matter of fact, if you have a Facebook account and you don't visit it for a day, or a week, or a month, the world does not stop evolving, right? So you miss out on whatever somebody's saying. The interesting thing to me is we've all been to dinner parties where the person here is scintillating, right? You're so happy you met them. You're so happy the hostess sat you beside them. The night could go on forever. And this person, if they choke on a chicken bone, you don't want them to die, but they'd stop talking, which would be such a relief, right? That happens to us three-dimensionally. So why wouldn't it happen to us on the internet? It's just an extension of our world. The interesting thing with Facebook is this. You, let's say you said yes to being friends with somebody on Facebook. And then you realize, oh, isn't that interesting? Every morning they put up a picture of their cat doing a somersault. I could just die if I see it one more time, right? So you decide you don't want to see it anymore. At the dinner party, you can't actually do this. But on Facebook, when you see the posting from somebody, if you move your mouse across their name, this won't show up otherwise, a little down arrow appears. And that down arrow, if you click on it, a menu comes up and it says block this person. That doesn't mean you can't go over to their page and look at things, but it means that their things won't be showing up on your wall, which is just sort of a relief. Um, are there any questions about social networking at this stage? Yes. Abby, I, I, I have, uh, I'm on Facebook for about three weeks now, and I have friends. Oh. <laughs> Is, is suggested to you, yes. Right. Okay, so what she's saying is she has she just got on Facebook. It's early, it's got just a few weeks, just a few friends, but she's seeing all kinds of things about people that are sort of related along the pipeline and probably getting suggestions about who you should be friends with. The success of this technology is about how many people use it. So Facebook is trying to integrate you into as many people as possible because that is what makes the website successful. So what they do is it's actually a calculation they do. They find you and they see the two friends you have. They look at all of my friends and they start suggesting them to you. And then they look at friends of my friends and they suggest them to you. And then on this wall where you see the postings, you have only wanted to be friends with two people, but if my name, if I'm one of your friends, and my name is mentioned in a post, that will come up on your wall as well. So it's all about the six degrees of separation to you is what you end up seeing on Facebook. So you can block some of that, but that is kind of the nature of the beast. That's what you sort of submit to when you get into this networking part. The networking isn't about, I'm going to ask you for a job. The networking is really spider web. If they'd said social spider web, it really describes it better than that, because that's what's happening is, your information is going out to all these other and just grabbing people that they think you might be interested in. So they make those suggestions. So when, when you send a message Such a great question. What she asked is, is when you put a message up on Facebook, does it just go to the person you want it to go to, or is it kind of going out to really anybody? And this is such a good question, because this just happened recently. 
when you post something on Facebook, you have the, I think it says like what's up or what are you doing or whatever, and that's the box that you type in, you know, my cat woke up and did another somersault this morning, whatever it is you want, hopefully more interesting than that. When you put that up, that is being seen by all of your friends and potentially all of theirs if they choose to share it. Here's what happened the other day. I have a friend in California, this guy who's divorced. On Facebook, he put up to a woman, but it was on his wall, I can't remember what her name is, I'm so excited about our date tomorrow night. And I thought that was weird, but then what was weirder was the woman he went out with the night before, underneath it, immediately said, I thought we had such a nice time, I can't believe you're going out with somebody else. And, I'm, and I picked up the old fashioned phone and I called Ian and I said, Ian, we're all watching you, get off of Facebook. It is possible in Facebook to send a private message, which is different than putting it on the wall. So you have, if you look in the left-hand sidebar, it says messages there, and you can send a private message. But here's my take with that. I just want, I've got so many places people are trying to tear at me. You know, you've got all these email addresses and phone numbers and websites. So I'd rather send an email to somebody than send a private message on Facebook because they might not look there. It, you know, you're not sure how. So if you are friends with somebody on Facebook but you don't have their email address, if you click on About, you'll see what email that they've offered on their, on their page. But it's always better. Even sending a private message falls under the same category as the email about my sister's house, right? So just be super cautious that you're not putting something in there because what's to stop somebody from forwarding it or printing it, really? So it's not that you're losing privacy. It's that we can't trust our friends. <laughs> That's the good news. <laughs> it's just you can't trust people. You just don't know they have. It's so much easier to pass it on, even accidentally. So you want to be super cautious, but whatever you put on the wall, assume that is out to the world, completely out to the universe. Yeah. So one further question mm -hmm. about that. At the bottom, when you just put the note, you cry on the bottom, at the end of that little line, it says, do you want to do it? Okay. But you have to put in here, like, send it now. Just hit the enter key on the keyboard. So she's, 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 writing, she's writing a post, and she doesn't know how to sort of get it sent. If you just hit the enter key on your keyboard, off it goes. So I gave you three handouts. The first handout was the 200 websites broken down by category. The second handout is 100 free apps. An app is a program that you pull onto either a tablet or a smartphone. It stands for softlication, softlication, software application. I made up a new word, softlication, I like it. Um, I am a cheap Yankee. I do not spend money on music, I do not spend money on books, and I do not spend money on apps when it comes to my tablet. So these are free apps that if you want to. So an app, for example, I teach computers all over the city and sometimes I have to go to the bathroom and I need to find a public bathroom. My favorite app is sponsored by Charmin and it's called Sit or Squat. And it finds exactly where you are and then it recommends to you what the nearest public bathroom is and then it actually has reviews. So you know like, oh, the doorman's kind of a crowd but it'll let you use the bathroom or whatever it is. So there are apps to sort of meet all of your different needs. That's what that piece of paper is. There's a third piece of paper that at the top says, the grandparents cheat cheat for staying in the game. And this piece of paper is because I've been touring the country for the past few years, been to over 20 states, and at the end of my talks, somebody in the audience will say to me, you know, with all this technology, I'm less in touch with my family than I've ever been. And I say, well, actually, statistically, that's not true. Statist the statistics say that you are, you're making point by point more contact with your family through text messaging, email, social networking, I would wager that though it is in numbers more, it's thinner in its value, right? That's what I think it is, it's thinner. It's their brief text messages, they're not good long phone calls. So this piece of paper gives you suggestions about how you can take the technology that's available to you and bridge it with what we're familiar with. Do not assume that the younger generation has rejected what you knew as a way to communicate. Assume that their parents didn't teach them about it. I'm gonna give you an example. Is I have two goddaughters, they live in California. Every summer since they were eight years old, they would come and fly over and spend time with me in New York in my cottage in Connecticut. Um, it was a few years back, we were in Connecticut. It is the goddaughter sitting over there, but I'll try not to point her out. <laughs> We went to what was a five and dime store that was a dollar store and now it's a dollar twenty-five store and there was a kiosk that had postcards. And she said, oh, postcards, that's so retro. I felt a thousand years old. But she bought a bunch of postcards and she sent them off. 
And I realized she got so excited about writing them. I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother would always send me stationery with my name embossed on it. And the first thing I wrote was the bread and butter letter thanking her for the stationery. So I ordered stationery with her name embossed on it. I had it sent to me, and I wrote my address and stamped five envelopes to make life easy. And I sent it to her at college, and I sent an email saying, will you be my pen pal? And she emailed back and said, what's a pen pal? Again, I'm a thousand years old. But since that time, letter writing has lived between the two of us. And I will tell you, they're the loveliest, sweetest. It's very sentimental for me, and I've kept them all. And at some point, I will give them back to her because People like writing letters. People like expressing themselves. It's just we've forgotten to tell them that they can do it or giving them the tools to do it. So don't assume that this technology has taken away those things. It's that nobody's taught it. I'm going to give you one more example. Um, who here has used Skype? S-K-Y-P-E. OK, for those of you who haven't, Skype is free. You know how I feel about that. Skype is a program that allows you to use the internet to either make phone calls or video calls if you want to. If you have a camera on your device, you can actually video with somebody live, face to face. I was in Berlin doing a bicycle ride from Berlin to Copenhagen. Oh, that's my phone saying I've been talking for 45 minutes. I could just go on if I didn't stop myself. Um, I was biking from Berlin to Copenhagen, and my mom emails me every day, three times a day. That's her job, so I know she's OK. And she didn't email one day come to find out that my mother had fallen down, unfortunately, and had broken her wrist in three places. So I was freaked out, and I was all the way in Berlin, and she was in Connecticut. I wanted to fly home, and my mother said to my sister very clearly, Abby is not allowed to leave. So instead, we Skyped each other. My sister brought her laptop into the hospital, where they had Wi-Fi, and there was a camera, there's a webcam built into the laptop. I had my computer with me in Germany, and there was Wi-Fi at the hotel, and for 45 minutes, my mom and I got to see each other and speak to each other for free from Berlin to Connecticut. That's what Skype does. So I'm going to give you this suggestion using that technology. What if you are the keeper of the family chocolate chip cookie recipe? Every time your grandkids come to visit you, they expect to have the cookies. And every time you go to visit them, they expect you to bring the cookies with you. What if you emailed the recipe to your grandchild and you said at 5 o'clock on Friday, I want you in your kitchen with all of the ingredients with your laptop. And I will be in my kitchen with all of the ingredients with my laptop. And you connect via Skype, and for 20 minutes, you show them how to put the little divot in the flour so that the eggs mix well. You show them about the cornflakes, which makes it crunchy. And you talk to each other while you cook together across the country. And then when the cookies go into the oven, you say goodbye to each other, and you mail your cookies to them, and they mail their cookies to you. That is taking advantage of the technology. I guarantee they'll love every single second of it. So that's what that piece of paper is about. It's about letting you bridge this technology in a way that brings your family closer to you. I have a new book out there um, and a website. And I want to introduce you to the website because there's some features in here that are free for everybody. The website's called askabbystokes.com. Who in here is a retired or still teacher or librarian? There's always somebody. Hail to the teachers and librarians. You guys have done such important work. What I did on the website is I created a page specifically for teachers and librarians to give them resources that they could use in their classes. Or I know I've spoken at over 130 libraries. What happens is the librarian's getting pulled away to go show somebody how to turn on the computer when they have other things they can do. So what I did was I put in a list of documents. These are all free. They can all be printed from the website. I'm showing it to you guys because I think some of these documents could be helpful to you. Like the second one down is how to choose a safe password. I walk you through what the safe password is and how you could actually choose one password and a little trick I have for having that password be unique for every website you use it on, but something you can actually remember. Um, but there are how to create a folder if you're organizing your files. We've got the recommended websites up there. So this is a resource for you guys as well. But if you know any librarians or teachers, pass on this information to them because they'll find it helpful. So, yes. It's, it's asking. You've got it down on every piece of paper I've given you. I'm a master marketer when it comes to the name of my website. But I did go too fast. But you're right, it's easier. A Abby Stokes is me. It's Ask Abby Stokes. So if you can remember my name, but it's on everything. When I wrote the book, 
the book basically, what makes this different than any of the past books I wrote, if in fact you ever saw them, is I had to eventually acknowledge tablets. So the book begins at the very beginning, assuming the reader may not have anything in their home, walks you through how you make your decision about buying it. So if you've already used a computer, it walks you through how to replace it. It divides up now between tablets and computers. I had to do that. So now if you have a tablet, you've got all the same information in the book as you have if you have a computer. The later chapters, or for those of us that I refer to as getting buyers, those of us who visit those 10 websites a week, but don't really know about safe online shopping, don't really know how to create a folder system so that you can organize your photographs, don't really understand security issues. That's what all the later chapters are, along with a troubleshooting chapter. I couldn't fit everything in the book. And technology keeps changing. So what I did was, I have now a page on my website that is free where there are 14 videos for you to watch that walk you through what is Dropbox and how do you use it? How do you put a passcode on your smartphone? How do you delete junk mail en masse when I'm using a tablet? So there are 14 different videos here for you. And I realized you can watch a video, but you can't actually follow the steps when you're watching a video. So underneath each of them are the words, click here for printable instructions. And when you click on those instructions, what happens is a page opens up like this that walks you through step by step each of the actions. And I break it apart by platform, which means there are Apple phones, that's the iPhone, and then there are, Microsoft has a phone, and then there are Androids, which run the Google system. I write the instructions for all three of the different platforms, because I don't know which it is that you're using. And you can print them. You can print them, so basically you watch the video, print the instructions, and then you, and you could try to follow it on the screen. If you have both a computer and a tablet, you could have it on the computer screen if you wanted to, but it, I think it's easier to print it. So that's free for you guys. That's all for everybody here to use anytime they want to. I also have a newsletter, which I just started doing. The last issue was about online dating, which was very successful, if anybody is interested in that. Um, on the table over there is a page that says Join Abby's Newsletter. If you want to put your email address down there, you can. Otherwise, you can visit my website and you can sign up this way. I promise you, on, on the Mayflower that we sailed in on, I will not give your email address to anybody else. It is only to be used for the newsletter. But they come out twice a month, and I do think they have helpful information. And I welcome you to email me with any questions. Yes? Do you archive? I do. The there is. Thank you. If you if you go to my website and you see resources and go down, it says newsletter archive and you can see the old newsletters. Thank you. Um, I feel free to email me with any questions at any time that you want to. Feel free to join me on Facebook if you want to. If you have a suggestion of, gosh, really, if I had a video of how to do this, send me an email with a suggestion and when time allows, I will put the video up for you. So I am here as your resource. There's one other thing that I put down on your chairs, which was the postcard. For those of you that don't want to buy a book today, but they call your daughter or son with all of your questions, you're going to send them the postcard. And you're going to say, buy this for me because it's a gift for you because I'll stop calling you with questions. So if you don't want to spend the $18 today, you can, you can make somebody else buy it for you with the postcard. Um, just to sort of finish up what else is at that table, um, the woman actually that was sitting in the back of the room who had to leave a few minutes ago for a meeting, Ooh, my phone's ringing. I forgot to turn off my... Oh, I wonder who that was. We wrote a book together that's not about computers. And I just thought I'd bring some because people have always said to me, why don't you ever bring that other book? It's called Dinner Party Disaster Stories, True Tales of Culinary Catastrophe. Thank you, Orfan. It's actually 18 true stories that were sent in to us of dinner party disasters. What I did was, I'm the one who wrote after each story how to either prevent it or what to do if it happens to you. And in the back of the book is a catastrophe pantry. So what should you always have on hand in case something happens, you can whip up another dinner. It makes a lovely wedding gift for a new bride, or it's nice instead of a bottle of wine if you want to do that. I want to now open it up for a few minutes to answer some questions, and then I'll skedaddle over there and sign some books. Okay, her 88-year-old father wants to write a novel, and she had suggested that he get a tablet, and I had said it's not the greatest idea. It's purely a question of ergonomics. Imagine him hunched over 60 pounds at a 60-degree angle trying to type on the screen of a tablet. So, you get an external Bluetooth keyboard, which is great, but 
the screen on a tablet is so small, when we're talking about that amount of text, he's not really going to have the opportunity to see very much of it in one shot. So the good thing is, with a tablet, what you can do that you don't often, you can do with a computer, but people don't as often. Good Lord, that isn't me. Tell my mom I can't talk right now. Um, is you can dictate into it. So you could use the dictation feature where he basically dictates it, and it's about now, it's about 90% accurate, 90, 95, where it'll actually pick up what you said. Then he could just use it to edit it with the keyboard. But again, the screen's a little small. Uh, no, it's all Bluetooth. Most tablets, some tablets have a USB drive, but a lot of them don't. So you have to make that a choice. When you, if it does, then you can you can plug into no, not the screen with a USB. I don't think there's. You might find I don't know if there's an external screen that would connect by Bluetooth. I don't know the answer to that. There probably is, but you can email me. You know, if you want, to, if you can't find it and you want to know, email me and I'll do a little research and find out. Any other? It's anything with technology. Yes. It's such a good question. Is there a particular tablet that is good when you go to Europe on a vacation? They all will work just as well as far as connecting to the internet. What you need to be aware of is if you're using a cellular data plan, which is the plan that goes to a satellite and to the internet instead of just Wi-Fi. If you just have Wi-Fi on the tablet, you'll connect to Wi-Fi. Whether you're in Bismarck, whether you're in wherever you are, you'll connect to the Wi-Fi. But if you're paying a monthly fee, for the cellular data plan, your charges for data when you're international are astronomical. So what you want to do is you want to call, if you have a data plan, whoever it is, Verizon, AT&T, whoever services you, you want to call them and you want to say, I'm going to be in this country for this amount of time. What's your international plan that I can use? And they'll give you a number and you'll see if it's comfortable for you. If it's not, if it's going to be too expensive, just be sure that you only use the device when it's in Wi-Fi mode in a Wi-Fi area. Because if you use it, you leave it on and just let it run for two weeks, you will come home and literally, I'm not kidding you, your bill could be $1,000. So you just want to be sure. And if you, before you travel, if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to walk you through the steps about how to make sure that it's only in Wi-Fi and you've turned off the data if you have a data plan. It can really add up. Often they'll be a little forgiving if it's the first time it happens. But Alita's traveled a lot with your technology. You're super careful about not. I just make sure everybody has Wi-Fi. Everybody has Wi-Fi. You really want to look for a Wi-Fi they spot. Have Wi-Fi. Yeah, they have Wi-Fi. They'll call it depending if you go to France. It is Wi-Fi. Yes. Are phones and cellular compatible everywhere in the world, or is there a? No, it's it's it. What will happen is when you go to a foreign country, like let's say you're using AT&T, and I go to Mexico, where it says AT&T in the top on my phone when it's connected here, it'll change to their companion company. It may be that you go someplace so remote there isn't a companion company, but usually it'll change to whatever. They're all interlocked with each other. But the physical device. The physical device is workable in China or. Germany. Not always. When you were in South Africa. Could you have used an iPhone? Yes. Yes, yes you could. But you could be super expensive. It depends on where you go, how remote you're going. What I would do if I were going someplace remote like that and I wanted a phone, you just buy a burner phone while you're there. Buy a super duper inexpensive phone that has a plan on it. So you're not going to exceed the plan because it has a limitation built into it. That's probably the safe, depending on how remote you're going. Yeah. Yes. Could you talk about the cloud printing? Sure, the cloud. Woo! There's a whole chapter in the book about the cloud. The cloud is, we all live in Manhattan or, or nearby. I live in a small apartment, relatively speaking. I've been there for 20 years. I got way too much stuff. When I have too much stuff in my apartment, I put it in mini storage. That way I have access to it, but it doesn't take up space in my home. That's exactly what the cloud is to your computer. You have a computer where you've got too much stuff on it or things you want to be able to access from anywhere, you move them to the cloud. So the cloud is basically external storage. It can be for photographs, it can be for documents. Dropbox is one website where you are able to take anything from your computer and you can store it on their, on their space, on their server. Up to a certain amount, it's free. What's it, the advantage of using the cloud above and beyond storing things is that when you put it on the cloud, you could then share it with somebody else. An example is we went to South Africa and we took a lot of videos with our phones. They were way too big 
to email to each other. It just wouldn't be emailed. So instead, we took it from the phone to Dropbox. We put it in the Dropbox file, and then I gave access to people who wanted to watch the videos, not to my account on Dropbox. I sent them a link so they could watch the videos on their devices. So Dropbox or other cloud devices like that, they're there to either let you store things so that they don't live on your computer, or you store things so you can access them from any computer, or you store them there so you can share them with other people. So just think of it like you would Manhattan Mini Storage. You're taking stuff, you're putting it someplace else, so you have access to it, but it's not in your apartment anymore. So in other words, it's not on your computer anymore. So it's, but if it comes to, there's a whole chapter about this. I don't trust technology. I teach you guys technology because I think you should learn how to use it, and if you want to, great, and I want to make sure everybody knows anybody can use it, but I don't trust it. So if it's an important family photograph, several things happen. I print it. I send it to Kodak and let them print it on actual photo paper because I don't know how long the pages on my printer are actually going to last. You know what fax paper? Remember when it all dissolved? I put it on the cloud and then I back it up onto a CD. So I'm pathological about making sure if it's something super important that I would really be heartbroken for, I save it in different, several different platforms. So it depends on how important it is to you. Sometimes the cloud is just enough. Sometimes putting it on an external hard drive is just enough. But it's really super important. I would put it in all places because at some point at least one of them is going to fail you. Right? That's just the way technology is. It's just life. Yes? Can you delete from the cloud? Let's say you're dealing with documents. Yes. So she said, can you delete from the cloud? Absolutely. Whatever you put on the cloud, you can delete from the cloud. Now, the caveat to that is, if I were the FBI, could I find what you once had on the cloud that you have since deleted? I'm going to assume that I leave footprints everywhere I go. So even though I've deleted it, it doesn't mean that it is completely gone from somebody who is able to get in there to look at it. That's the reality of the life we live in. But, I mean, somebody can break into your house the same way. So the answer is yes, you can delete it so you have more space in your file. It is super duper 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 unlikely that somebody's going to be able to trace back what it was. But I always have to say that caveat is nothing's really deleted. I had a client who was an ambassador and had lots of very important people's phone numbers in his old phone. And when it came time to transfer to the new phone, we took the old phone, we put it in a Ziploc bag, I got a hammer, and I broke it into many different pieces, and I threw them away in many different trash cans. Because I just thought that was the only way to feel secure that nobody could get their hands on the information. So we just, you do leave a footprint behind. Yeah. Yes. Um. So, yes. Yeah, so she just said recently she was told that CDs will no longer be used. Do you remember eight-track tapes? I loved eight-track tapes, and they're gone. It happens. Media changes all the time. So we've gone from eight-track tapes to cassette tapes to CDs to now something else that's going to be smaller and lighter and faster potentially. What you need to do when that transition happens, and I think, you know, you, I still have a computer that has a floppy disk drive, so you can hang on to this technology, but what you want to do before that, when you hear it's really happening, which it probably will happen, you want to be sure you hang on to your old computer that reads CDs for now, so that you can take what's on the CD and probably put it up on the cloud. And then whatever the newest media is to save things, you'll take it from the cloud and you'll burn it or copy it onto that new method, whatever it is. But it is not a, I don't think we're looking at around the corner, but look at your look at your records and your record player, right? That's the direction we're going in is smaller. Yes. Actually I was in a Martinovia strain and those people send me back. Well and that's the whole go the whole go retro thing. I had two grandparents this year at Christmas when I was teaching them how to shop, I had two grandparents say to me, my grandchildren want a record player, can we still find it online? So, you know, what's old is new. It happens with fashion, for good or bad. It happens with this stuff as well. So, don't hang on to everything, maybe, because you don't have space. But it's interesting. Because, I mean, I don't know. But, uh, yeah. They have a little, little record player that you can buy, and then the records are like 2295. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting what happens. But, it, you know, uh, who knows what's going to happen with the technology? It's going to keep on changing. I don't want to take up any more of your afternoon.